Our next guest is a former UFC light heavyweight champion, a WEC light heavyweight champion, and a strike force middleweight champion. You may know him from his battles around the world or his hit show, Jim Rescue, which was an awesome show last year. Frank Shamrock, welcome to Submission Radio. Oh, right on. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you back on the show, Frank. We always enjoy chatting to you. Now, uh, you know, we were excited to see that you're starting to do a number of seminars in the U.S. What motivated you to go back into teaching? Well, it's pretty much my little girl. She, um, I got her all excited about martial arts, and she's on a whole martial arts journey. So she told me that I should be teaching martial arts. So thus, I'm teaching martial arts now. <laughs> Simple. All right. Well, uh, I guess what's the most exciting part about this big journey? You know, what are some of the places that you're going to be going around, you know, in America uh, teaching all these uh, Frank Shamrock seminars? Well, right now we're going to do the uh, East Coast and the West Coast, and then we'll probably do the uh, middle of the U.S. And then we'll probably shoot over and do like uh, some European um, European countries. Wow. And um, yeah, my friends want me to go to uh, South America, although I just haven't really committed to that because school is still in session. Um, so, but yeah, I figured, uh, you know, like uh, when I was younger, I would uh, just travel the world and I'd teach and I'd kind of spread the, you know, spread the message and, you know, share the new techniques I was learning as the sport of mixed martial arts was evolving. And um, I really felt like I was at the forefront of that whole evolution. And um, so it's nice to go back through and just see where everybody's at and, uh, you know, use, and teach uh, for, you know, really good techniques that have kind of stand, stood the test of time and that have proven really valuable for both traditional martial arts and then mixed martial arts training. Uh, Frank, I want to ask you, because I know a lot of the European fans must be curious. You said you're going to Europe. Whereabouts in Europe uh, are you going to go? Do you know yet? No, it hasn't been decided yet. Um, I've been, uh, I've had quite a few requests to go to uh, Ireland, but I might just start there. Plus, I'm really into hiking these days. Mm. So um, I really want to do some hiking and kind of combine the two uh, the two activities. But I just haven't decided on a place yet. This, the um, the one in Long Island, the East Coast one, just came up as part of other productions that I was doing. I'm giving a keynote for um, the uh, Martial Arts Business Association. Um, and then I thought, I should teach because my daughter keeps saying that I should teach. And I figure a six-year-old pretty much knows what's going on with the world. <laughs> so you should, you know, follow their lead. Follow their lead when, uh, you know, when given the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the uh, the six, you got to keep the six-year-olds happy. Now, I mentioned Jim Reski. You know, me and Casper and a lot of the other Australians, we really got really into the show. There's some really great episodes. And then we were pretty disappointed when we had Randy Couture on our show a few weeks ago, and he mentioned there wouldn't be any more episodes. Is that true? Because the show was awesome. Yeah, unfortunately, right now, they haven't ordered more, which is... Uh, sort of a new vibe in the uh, television industry. Um, you know, the show did really well. It was really well received in uh, on television and with ratings and in, in the industry themselves. Uh, but yeah, it just, it wasn't picked up. So I guess we're, uh, I guess it's done. I don't know. May, well, you say they haven't ordered any more yet. Maybe you and Randy need to do some kind of new show where it's like Network Rescue and then you do Spike first and you're like, here's your problem, not enough Gym Rescue, then they have to follow your advice and then boom, more Gym Rescue. I, I don't yeah, know. You, you scare them into it, Frank. I've seen I've seen an angry Frank Shamrock on the show and I would not say no to you if you get angry. So I think that's all that needs to happen. Well, for sure, yeah. And I got angry a couple of times on that show because, uh, you know, I didn't really realize that that uh, the gym industry and the fitness industry was very similar to the martial arts industry and that there was a lot of people that lacked business acumen and that, you know, just didn't really have a plan for their business. Mm. Um, so it was easy to get, it was easy to get riled up when you're facing a guy who's, you know, losing a friend's money or, you know, who's basically, you know, breaking down pieces of the community because they just don't know their business. And, yeah. Uh, it, it, it was a very interesting experience to see the parallels between the two industries. Uh, I mean, to jump feet first into fitness like that was pretty was pretty cool. I was glad I had Randy by my side because he's a tough character to deal with, oh, uh, yeah. especially on camera. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, a quick look on your IMDb shows that you've, you've actually been involved in a few shorts and movies for 2015. Can we expect to see uh, Frank Shamrock coming to the big screen in the coming years? You know, I have a couple of projects that we're working on, and I'm sort of slowly evolving into an executive producer guy. Mm. Um, which which more just means I'm putting the shows and the deals together that I want to do. 
Um, and I started doing the same in fighting at the end of my fighting career, really, you know, getting the promotion, getting the opponent, like getting the story, getting the media. Um, so now we're just doing it at a different level for television and for film. So, yeah, I think this year you're going to see a little, uh, a few projects. Uh, the last one that we just did through my new production company was the uh, Mike Tyson uh, Glory Countdown. We literally show. watched that yesterday. Which, That's great. That's really yeah, good. That was your, that yeah, was your company. Cool, right? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that was my that was my company and my boy Lee Simons. We pulled the whole thing together for uh, for the Glory brand to really try to take them to the next level. And then tonight, Mike's going to actually commentate for the first time ever uh, over Glory Kickboxing with my uh, talent team, Stephen Quadros and Mauro Ronaldo at the live Glory show tonight. So mm-hmm. it's kind of uh, a whole package for them, and that's where my my hat has sort of fallen these days because I'm I'm too old to be beating people up, and you know the teaching really hurts my back and stuff. So I do that selectively, and the rest of it is try to produce television and ideas that promote martial arts, mixed martial arts, and the benefits of a lifestyle like that. Well, speaking of the crazy world of mixed martial arts, Frank, you know, the big news this week was Anderson Silva testing positive you know, to PEDs. You know, as someone who's being looked up to as a legend such as yourself in the sport, you know, what were your, what were your thoughts when you heard the news? Were you shocked like the rest of us? Yeah, I mean, I, I was shocked. But, I mean, it's been like 10 years now that I've been shocked. I think we were the only sport that allowed athletes to actually do steroids legally. And I don't even know what that was about. Um, But, yeah, I mean, it appears like the new generation is just, you know, throw the rules aside, make your money. Um, You know, the the idea of sort of living by the rules and honor and respect has kind of been tossed out the window. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't even know what to say about it because, you know, I mean, back in the day, which is, gee, I realize it's been some time now, um, you know, it was about the game and it was about winning the game and the rules, you know, finding the way, finding the, the solution, finding the shot, finding the, the technique, finding the position. Um, and now it seems like it's about something else. You know, it's about the, you know, the, the gimmick, the drug, the thing. And it's like, the sad part is I, I can't, you know, I can't turn it on for my daughter. You mm. know, I can't share with her the, the sport that I built because it's like, she's like, okay, I don't understand. He's on drugs and <laughs> uh, wow. like, I can't even, I can't even, I can't even explain it. Um, and that to me, you know, that concerns me because this is supposed to be martial arts. This is supposed to be, you know, how we lead a generation as sports heroes. And, you know, I can't even turn it on for my daughter. That, that part just, it just blows me away. It just blows me away. Yeah, it definitely is a huge shame. I think Anderson's one of those guys where no one ever suspected him. And I think now a lot of the f- MMA fans, it's kind of like telling him Santa's not real. Like if Anderson, you know, tests a positive, every, all the people on the internet are like, well, you know, everyone must be on it. You know, I'm wondering, Frank, you know, is it is this the kind of thing where the new generation or is, is it's a new thing where a lot of guys are now doing it? Or is this just a case where it's always been there and now the testing is just showing that it's always been there? You know, it's always been there, but now the culture is like, it's better to get caught than X. So it's just different now. You know, before it's like you went down that path, you know, that was a, that was a choice. You were a cheater. You were, you know, you were bending the limits. And I didn't mind fighting those guys because they, they were never in the right state of mind. You know, they were never focused and cheat out and had a martial vision because they were on something else. So I didn't mind it. Uh, and I thought it was a benefit going into a fight. Like when I thought Baroni, when I thought, you know, giant dudes, I was like, yeah, let them be all crazy and, you know, out of their mind and also nervous, you know, because if you're not putting in the time at the gym and you need a tool like that, then you know it, you know it in your heart and soul. So, you know, it's, for me, it's just like, it's a personal choice. And now I think the personal choice is too easy to make, you know, and there's no re- Nothing's going to happen to these guys. They're going to make millions of dollars. They're like, yep, sorry. Sorry, fans, I led you astray. It's like, <laughs> dude, that's not, that's not what it's supposed to be about. You know, Michael Jordan didn't do that stuff. But, you know, you know we want to be taken seriously as a sport. We need heroes that stand above the beyond. And it's like, until we get there, it's like we're going to be, you know, the guy fighting in a cage in a dang spandex. That's a great point, Frank. And, you know, you, you've got an amazing legacy. Casper mentioned people thought Santa Claus died when they heard the Anderson Silver news. Do you think this tarnishes Anderson's legacy in the long run? Do you think it might overshadow some of the great things that he's done in the sport? Um, sadly, probably no. 
Wow. That, that may be the worst. That may be the worst part. Is I, it's now so common and so. Oh yeah. Oh gosh. There it is. Um, you know, people think that's what our sport's about. People think we're a bunch of dudes on steroids with tattoos fighting in a cage. Mm. And that's, I mean, I was at Congress speaking about this, you know, 10, 15 years ago going, we're not those people. Uh, but somehow we're those people. Like, that's what our culture is producing. And I just, I don't see an end to it. I don't know how we stop it. You know, I don't, I don't, you know, how do you say to Anderson Silva, look, oh, you're in the wrong on this one. Mm. Because it's now, it's indicative of our culture. This is what they do. This is what we do. You know, John John does cocaine, and Anderson Silva does, it's like, what really, you know, I, I came from a school where you, you trained hard in martial arts, you know, you, you followed the rules, you studied the rule book, and you found a way to win, you know, at whatever cost. And it's like, those days are done. Yeah, I mean, I want to I want to bring up something that you said years ago. You know, after you fought Nick in two thousand nine, you mentioned that it felt to you like the passing of the torch. You know, like you passed the torch to Nick. What do you think about the fact that he may be retiring again, especially after failing another drug test due to marijuana? <laughs> I, I I mean, I just think it's sad that that is the future generation. That you know, Nick Diaz is the future. You know, there's a million kids going, I want to be like Nick. And it's like, you don't want to be like Nick? Um, you know, and I, I just don't think there's any forethought to it. You know, I, I came up as a martial artist, and it may have been accidental. Like, I may have accidentally been, you know, dragged down or pushed down or guided down the martial arts path. But at the end of the journey or in the middle of the journey, however you want to look at it, I can see what works and what doesn't. Um, and that... You know, the minute you, you sell your soul, the minute you, you know, do steroids, the minute you, you know, you, you break the rules in such a way that you can't come back, it's like, you know, then it just changes who you are. And then your fan base and your everything changes. And it's like now the whole generation has changed. Um, and the craziest thing was, I mean, I felt it. When I was fighting Keto Ortiz, I could feel that they wanted him to win. And that was in 1999. Because he was a bad boy. He was a this guy. He was a that guy. You know, he was a flipper offer guy. I could feel it. I was like, wow, this is, you know, what an amazing, weird feeling that they want this, you know, perception of a bad person to win. Um, and then when I fought Nick Diaz, you know, I felt it was in the first minute. Like, they were like, yeah, yeah Frank Cole, we need to get rid of him. <laughs> we like this guy. Wow. Um, but it's a public perception. It's what, it's what society is looking for right now. And right now it's okay to do drugs okay to do steroids it's okay to do this and do that it's perfectly okay and we're the sport that says it's okay and it's like at the end of the day you know that just saddens me you know because that's not that's not what i'm teaching my children and that's not what i was taught and that's not what i believe certainly you know there's a few things going on in the world in mma one of the other things we wanted to get your thoughts on was you know one of your good friends kung lee is one of the original fighters be behind the ufc lawsuit that's happening right now you know, we never did get an opportunity to get your thoughts on it. What do you think about this whole situation, this whole UFC lawsuit? Well, I mean, I think it's a long time coming. You know, they have organically monopolized the industry. Um, you know, and many may say it was a you know, course of business that they grew this way. I, I certainly think and know that their intentions were malicious, that their direction was defined. But, you know, it's a course of business. They've grown big enough to where, you know, you can throw giant rockets at them and, and antitrust lawsuits and, you know, most certainly their structure of business should be examined and investigated because it seems that it's controlling an entire industry and monopolizing its revenue streams towards them. I know with these lawsuits, you know, they usually take a long time. What do you, what do you think? Do you think the, this, this will actually make a big difference? Do you think that Kung Lee and, you know, all the other guys that are suing the UFC, do you think they have a chance of winning or do you think the UFC are too powerful? I don't know. At this point, you know, I mean, the right now, I think the challenges are, you know, proving that the structure right now is, you know, a controlling structure and sort of built in their fashion so they always win. Uh, that's really hard to prove. And then secondary, I think, you know, they want to try to prove that the, the actual process of business is wrong. Mm. You know, that you can't monopolize talent and control their likeness 
and in perpetuity. You just can't continue to milk them, you know, after they're done uh, without some type of compensation. Uh, and, and that was my original beef and concern with the UFC in the first place. Gosh, back in 1999. Mm. You know, it's like every other talent, every other mm -hmm. artist, they don't control you forever and ever and be able to monetize you. At some point, you can have that back and continue to build on the asset that you've created. Um, and, and, you know, with the UFC and with other promotions in this industry, they control everything forever. Uh, so your ability to make money is only that night. That's it. And then you're, you're on to the next thing. Hey, I wanted to also ask you, you know, with Kung, obviously the thing that b before the actual lawsuit happened, obviously it was because of his retirement, you know, what was it like having such a history with Kung Lee in Strike Force, you know, in San Jose, you know, the two of you guys actually fought, what was it like seeing him retire? I mean, it was bittersweet. I enjoyed his style. Um, and, I, you know, I sparred, Kung was the guy that really taught me stand-up, you know, and range and everything, because I, I was his sparring partner for years before we fought. Um, and he was beat on me, because I didn't really know that much about striking. I was sort of learning the whole thing. Um, so I have a lot of ring time with Kung, and I have a lot of experience and a lot of respect for him. And his style, because his style is, uh, you know, a lot of the moves he does are, are very effective, but they go against the biomechanics of the body. So they mm. use a lot of energy. They're very dynamic. Um, and you know, I could always tell with his style that, you know, it was like a, it's like my style. It was a young man's style based on athleticism and angles and stuff. Uh, so I could always tell the age was going to catch up with him like it did to me. Uh, so I just loved his career and the way he's manipulated and, um, you know, used his martial arts to manipulate the game of MMA. Uh, and I have tremendous respect for him. It was sad to see him go, but you know, it's like when you get older, you don't want to hurt no more. Now, Frank, we just want to change. We just want to change directions because we know we only have a few minutes left. We really want to hear about this incident, actually, la a lack thereof. You know, uh, we everybody's heard the story, but we're not sure if the MMA fans have heard it yet. So we just want to ask you about it. When Mickey Rourke apparently flew you and a couple of other guys down to the WWE a few years ago, you know, Mickey had a big part in WrestleMania against Chris Jericho, who's a wrestler for any MMA fans who weren't sure. And Mickey was legitimately mad at Chris Jericho about the things that he said about, to him on Larry King. Now, you were apparently one of the enforcers that he brought down in case anything got physical. You know, is this true? And you can, can you tell us a little bit about exactly what happened? Yeah, totally. Well, you know, Mickey's a good friend of mine. So when, um, when he got the call to do WrestleMania, he thought that there was a good chance they might double cross him. Like jump him or this or that or whatever. Because he's like, hey, he's old school. It's like in the street. He's mm. like a real dude, hardcore. Mm. So... He calls me up and he's like, what's the man? He's like, I got my film career going again. I had to rush those up to these awards and everything. He's like, there's no way I can go down like this. <laughs> he's like, if they pull something mm -hmm. on me, I need, I need some backup. So uh, he's like, bring, you know, he's like, I want you to come out and I want you to bring just a killer with you, like just in case. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I brought, uh, so I flew out, um, went out to his uh, big pad in, uh, in Hollywood, and then we also out on uh, Vince's private jet, and I brought uh, Clint Coronel, who's the Aztec. He's like a Golden Gloves boxer, an MMA fighter, and just hardcore-looking dude. Wow. And, um, yeah, he's Mickey serious. Like, he didn't understand that it was a gimmick, that Jericho was, you know, using it as a promotional tool. Mm. Um, you know, Mickey's like me. He's from the street. So if you say, hey, I want to, you know, hey, I'm calling you out, it's like, oh, we need to deal with this. You know, before yeah. it goes somewhere else. So he thought it was real. He thought they were going to have an altercation. He didn't know what the end result was going to be. And, um, and he brought some forces, and I was in that group. So, yeah, it was crazy. I'd never been to WrestleMania. It was like one of my childhood dreams. Um, and then, you know, within like two weeks, we're on Vince's plane. I'm sitting there ringside, and the whole thing's happening. And I was just like, wow, what a crazy experience. That's insane. Well, you know, I read that when you were a kid, you know, you didn't watch too much TV other than boxing and pro wrestling. What was it like being there? And, you know, what was your experience like with Vince? Apparently, and this is what Jerrica says, apparently Vince was like, oh, you know, you, you take Mickey and I'll take I'll take the short guy, which, you know, you were allegedly that short guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, uh, you know, they had their own world going on. Uh, we came in like hot and heavy and we're going to we're gonna do some serious damage. But the whole thing, like, we figured out, I figured all along that it was, you know, pro wrestling. And that's what you do. You build up a gimmick and then you work it out. Um, but Mickey was so convinced and so on edge that, uh, 
you know, we uh, we stood in line like good soldiers. But yeah, they were honestly, they were like, uh, what 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 brings him up down here? Why has he got this scary guy with him? It was totally um, a weird like uh, situation. And but once they sat down and broke it down and kind of went through the whole thing, and then Vince and all those guys got in the ring, worked it out, and you know everybody felt good about it. And I was just like a kid. I mean, I'm like, are you kidding me? And all this is happening uh, right around me, and that was pretty neat. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, speaking of the world of professional wrestling, you know, your brother Ken, just quickly touching on this because we know you have to go. Your brother Ken, you know, he's actually going to be taking on a bare-knuckle legend, James Quinn, uh, sometime in 2015. Just wanted to get your thoughts on that as well. You know, did you what did you think when you heard that he's going to be doing a bare-knuckle boxing match? And, you know, James Quinn, he's a pretty well-known guy. You know, who, who would win a bare-knuckle boxing match between those two, in your opinion? I I don't know. I mean, when I first heard about it, I thought it was a joke, like a media thing, or a media hook or something. But um, yeah, I mean, it looks like he's intent on doing. It. I think it's I think it's kind of crazy. Um, but I mean, I don't know. Who knows what I'll be doing when I'm like fifty one, fifty two? I might get some crazy, <laughs> you know, desire to go jump off a mountain or something crazy like that. Um, I hope it's not because he needs money. You know, I hope he's taking care of his business and stuff and. And this is what he's doing in his, you know, spare time. Mm. Um, but who knows? You know, who knows? I, I think by looking at the industry, like I said earlier, the money flows go one, you know, it goes one way. So I think we're going to see a lot of guys like Ken, you know, a lot of guys like Don Fry and just the older generation. There's just no more money. You know, there's no more physical being. There's no more ability to work. There's no more, and you know, there's nothing for them. Um, you know, and in a real sports industry, there's, there's a layer built there. You know, to where those guys are honored and taken care of and can support and, you know, participate in the industry. Well, for now, I know that you said that, uh, for now, it's good to hear that seminars and hiking are your thing, uh, Frank. If you ever do decide to take on <laughs> Bare Knuckle or anything, we'll definitely be excited to see it. Guys, don't forget to follow Frank on Twitter at Frank Shamrock or visit his website, frankshamrock.com, uh, for more information about his upcoming seminars. We're super excited. 2015 is going to be a great year, Frank. And as always, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. And hey, if I ever decided to do Bare Knuckle, you guys better call me and talk me out of it. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, we'll call you and have you on the show and we'll help you promote it, buddy. <laughs> I, might, I, might, I might pay you a couple hundred bucks if I could be the water boy. You know? <laughs> that would be, be the best moment of my life. Yeah. Thank I'm going so- to lean on you guys. No, I'm going to lean on you guys to call me and be like, okay, this is crazy. I need you to. <laughs> Put down the bottle of beer and move forward. Well, we've got a recorder now, so we'll just play this back to you and be like, remember what, well, remember what you said? That's you saying it to us, Frank. But yeah, we we know you have to go, so, so we'll let you go. Always a pleasure chatting to you, Frank, and um, good luck in your conference. All right, thanks, guys. 